this is a day that I'd hoped would never come. And uh, I first want to, I want to thank Coach Frost. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity to get to know Scott a little bit and have really come to appreciate him. You know, Scott worked really hard here. Um, Scott loves Nebraska. He'll always be a Husker. He's a Nebraskan. And he worked really, really hard here. He really wanted this thing to work. And I can tell you that I really wanted this thing to work. Our donors wanted it to work. Everybody wanted it to work. And so, uh, in a way, it's unfortunate and sad that we're, that we're here today. Yeah, there's nine games left in the season. And uh, I think we owed it to the players. We owe it to our fans to give these players an opportunity these last nine games. Um, we've got good players on this football team. And so having a different voice and, and having some new energy and enthusiasm, I'm hoping, um, can make a difference for this team. We're going to do a national search. You know, we're going to engage some third-party help, mostly for logistics and other things. I want you to know as well, and I would encourage our fans and everyone to recognize there will be a lot of rumors out there. There's going to be a lot of innuendo. Um, I want you to know that, that these sort of decisions and processes are not made in a silo. I have a lot of great mentors and friends that we'll be working with. They've got nine games left. We've got a great opportunity this weekend against Oklahoma. And so we're going to support them as best we can going forward. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Severe and welcome to Big Red Wrap-Up on Nebraska Public Media. Saturday was the final game for Scott Frost as head coach at Nebraska and opens up a new era with Mickey Joseph with the interim title. We're going to talk all about it. Former Husker Jay Moore and Sean Callahan joining us here on the wrap-up. What would you think Sunday when you, when you heard it, when it came through at 11.50 or whatever? Not surprised. Uh, when I, uh, just, I knew this, the game was going to be close. With, with Georgia thought I knew yeah. it would be rather uncomfortable. And if it would happen, I told people, he's probably not going to make it through the week. I mean, I would be surprised if he, he wasn't even going to make it. You know, it could happen Saturday night, in my opinion. That's how quickly it could have happened. Even with the idea that the buyout was going to drop? Yeah. Okay. That, that's, that is, I know some people are kind of frustrated by that. To me, that is such, that's like seven rings down, like, the importance. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I know seven and a half million dollars is a lot of money to people. That's, to me, that's peanuts to the University of Nebraska. You can't risk to have this guy as a face of your program for the rest of the season or whatever it is to continue to do the things the way he was doing, I mean, that's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you recruiting. It's going to cost just to face your program is, is just going to take a detrimental hit uh, to it. So I think the $7 million is, is it's not that big a deal, in my opinion. Now, I know some people are probably saying, you're, Jay, you're crazy. And I've been told that many times before, so it's no <laughs> big deal. Uh, but, yeah, it definitely. Um, wasn't surprised, and it was just it, 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 he ran, it ran his course, and it was it was time to move on. What about you, Sean? Yeah, I, leaving the stadium, he just had a feeling that yeah, when you take a couple steps back, and, and Georgia Southern in a first-year system, a team that went three and nine, put up more yards than any team in the history of Memorial Stadium, an opposing team, that gets your attention. Mm -hmm. And the way things have played out in Dublin, Ireland, to start the year with 12,000 Nebraska fans that traveled out there, the onside kick call the way they struggled with North Dakota. I mean, it just had a bad feeling all the way through. I, I, I think the thought was, all right, will they keep letting him go to October, as you said? And you take a few steps back and look at just the brand damage it would cause Nebraska, like big noon kickoff coming in. It's a commercial for, for your, your university. Right. If you would go forward with Coach Frost as a lame duck, kind of knowing that he's basically just coaching two more weeks to save money, that wouldn't be good for Nebraska. And you want to utilize the coverage to keep promoting your brand and the program in a positive light. Um, so I, I think Trev's like, look, we can afford $7.5 million in our world right now with the new media rights deal and what we've done to the contract already. It's really not that much money. Mickey's not a surprise to you. And he's associate head coach, so that's the one that normally moves up. But also, Whipple having to call plays, Shenander calling plays. Mickey makes sense to you as interim? I thought that's the way it was, was going. I mean, just with the, already having the associate head coach mm -hmm. title, uh, obviously with his, his history here playing quarterback in the early 90s, I thought that's the way it was going. I thought Chenander might get a shot just because, but... But after what happened with, on Saturday. Well, yeah, correct. <laughs> with the defensive performance, it was, there was no, there was, there was one guy in my mind, that was Mickey. 
So I'm excited to see what he's able to, what he's able to do. I'm excited to see the changes he's going to implement in this team. I'm excited to see uh, the new energy, a yep. new voice, a new a new system. I don't want to say system, but just the the new energy that can be brought into this. I like what he's about. He's high energy, but he's also high no BS. You know, he's it's very black and white with him. Where I think there were this team has struggled with Scott, there was a lot of gray area in my opinion. I don't think the roles were very defined with Scott. And I, 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 I can guarantee you roles are going to be very defined with, with Mickey in these last nine games. Accountability was mentioned a couple times by Trev Alberts. Accountability is obviously very important. As a player, mm -hmm. as a coach, as an athletic director, how much do you think that was the one of the reasons why it was moved on? I, I mean, six, th 16 and 31 sure. and 16 and 31. And I think everyone was willing to give this rope. They had one of the better opening three-game stretches you're going to see Nebraska have. They were double-digit favorites three straight weeks in a row. They went one and two. Yeah. And, I mean, that's, that's a bad sign. So, you know, that schedule was set up to go 3-0. Yes. Not in two and one at worst. They went one and two, and they struggled in the FCS game. So, I, I think Trev was smart enough. And you start to think about the sellout streak, too. Um, and other games, like, I don't know. Is and Indi tickets are sold, right? In but I don't know about Indiana. I know the non-conference games Yeah, I thought, I thought they ended up selling it. But I know that the, one of the concerns is people not going. No shows. Yeah, no shows and concessions and just having the picture on TV of no one in a whole section. Like, I, talk, I just talked to one of my friends coming yeah. in, and he's like, yeah, me and my brother, we just left at halftime, and we went to the bar and yeah. drove closer to our house because – we, we couldn't take it. I mean, when you give up 642 yards, yeah. um, it's, tough. it's tough to sit there and watch. Until yeah. they stop having, start having alcohol in the state. It makes <laughs> those, makes those losses you know, easier to deal with. Naturally, there's a lot to talk about tonight. And, of course, we want to hear from you to be a part of it. Give us a ring. Our friends at the University of Nebraska's College of Journalism and Mass Communication will answer your phone calls while enjoying some Valentino's pizza, including some thin crust. Our sports intern, Sam. Hey, Sam, is here to manage the room. And if you prefer to email or text tonight, you can also do that at bigred at nebraskapublicmedia.org. If you're thinking of social media, send us your comments and questions, and we're going to be watching Facebook and Twitter. Just reach out. We'll help drive our conversations, of course. Our sideline survey is up and ready for your vote. Do you agree with the dismissal of Scott Frost? Yes is at 65%, no at 20%, and should have waited until after October 1st is at right now 15%. Head to our website to vote and head back each week for a brand new survey. That actually did surprise me because I thought Sunday, the only criticism I heard of it was from people saying, why didn't you just wait to October 1st? Why not save the money? It appears, at least by that, that people don't care about that anymore. Yeah, the, the money thing, you know, Trev worked so hard to get the contract negotiated right. and put that, you know, he talked about metrics. What is the metric? Well, October 1st is a pretty big metric. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's why it surprised it. But that game was so bad. Like, it would have been really hard to trot Scott Frost out this week yeah. and say, all right, spin this. Like, I, I just think when you have a game like Saturday night, I don't know how you could move forward knowing kind of what was going to happen and why, why let it go on any further. Yeah, look at this, this graphic that are bringing up on the screen right now um, just to show you how bad it was. Second half, second loss to a Sunbelt Conference team in the Frost era, which is incredible to think about. Defensive allowed 642 yards, as you said, Sean. Most ever at Memorial Stadium. Forced only one punt versus Georgia Southern. Did have two turnovers. And then fell to 214-1 and one at Memorial Stadium when scoring 35 or more points. That's a lot of history. Yeah, it's right there. I mean, that, that was just in one game. And we almost went to overtime, and they had a chance to get the all-time record against Nebraska, <laughs> but it went to overtime. Yeah, they could. They, if they went to overtime, they were looking at 700 real quick. Yeah. It's amazing that 1956 Oklahoma record for most yards on Nebraska, that still stands. Yeah, one of the greatest teams. They, they weren't running time. no huddle in 1956. Yeah, it's one of the greatest you know, So time. to put up that kind of yardage back then, it's pretty amazing. You mentioned after the game that feel, and I was walking back to the car, and I was kind of in my head forming a tweet about it, and I was thinking, you know, I remember 07, the way it felt after Oklahoma State was pretty obvious. 2014, Wisconsin was very obvious, I think, to everybody. Northern Illinois, you lose to Northern Illinois, somebody's got to get fired. Sean Eichos got fired, Mike Riley was going. This certainly felt like that kind of game, right? That it just, you can't go past losing to Georgia Southern. Yeah, People, coach. I, I woke up on Sunday, went to church, and then le I said, I'm going to the office. Like, I, I just knew at like 10 was coming. Yeah. I didn't ha have a heads up, but it just didn't feel right. Like, something about it. Like, there's just no way they can go forward to the normal Monday right. and say, all right, we're playing Oklahoma this week. It, it just didn't have that. You know, something was going to have to happen. And, and uh, you know, I give Trev credit. I mean, he didn't hesitate and drag his feet. Um, and, and now we're going to have probably one of the longest coaching searches we've ever seen. More than 100 um, days. Yeah. You know, it's, it's going to be uh, very interesting. So let me ask you this, because all these one-score games, mm -hmm. again, another one on Saturday. 
if you were going to boil it down to one reason why this is happening, could you do that? Like, why? It's, it's, it's so consistent. You know they're going to play a yeah. one-score game and they're going to lose it, which is, analytics-wise, that shouldn't happen. Correct. You should win some You'd of think those. You would think you would luck into getting yes. a bounce. Mm -hmm. To me, it, it's... it's it's very complicated, but yet I'm trying to simplify this as best in my mind and, and just trying to dissect everything. And just to me, it comes down to organization, efficiency, and just lack of effort as a, it, to me with, with Scott. Um, that's, the, that's the thing that I think that's going to frustrate, frustrate me the most. As a former player, as knowing Frost and being in that, you know, quote unquote brotherhood with, with being hit with a former player, I don't yeah. think he gave all his all what whatever what he had i think there was a lack of effort i really do and his his attention to detail was a part of it um so i i don't want to get too far into the weeds but i that's that's definitely some to it you you get you get out what you put in and i don't think you put everything in mm -hmm. and there are football gods there is karma there is if you work hard and you do the right things you're going to win some games i just don't think scott did the right things behind the scenes to win enough football games with his university yeah. that's just plain and simple karma is the perfect word yeah. there were weeks too where it, you know they were clearly the better team and they would play down and yeah. i go back to 2020 the illinois loss oh yeah and the minnesota loss mm -hmm. those were inexcusable losses considering the context illinois was you know, Lovey Smith was on his way out. That was a bad Illinois. Minnesota game. was down 50 players. Minnesota was down to like nobody. Yeah. And they just, you know, those those games, mm -hmm. you know, were killer because they could have they could have turned that year around and finished probably five and three, and that would have been on an eight game Big Ten schedule in 2020. You know, that would have been a nice feel going into the off season, and then they right. voted not to go to a bowl game that year after they beat Rutgers. So that 2020 year really was a downhill year the way it went for Nebraska. So you were on a team, obviously, you know, coach gets fired, Solich does, you go to the bowl game, you rally around Bo. Do, do you see the possibility of the team rallying around Mickey? I, th I think so. I, it's, it's, it's not that far off from a similar situation. I mean, Mickey was here, was, well, he's only been here, you know, since spring ball. Bo right. got here, you know, the, the, the spring uh, before 03, and you got, got to, you know, evolve with him and mm -hmm. as a defensive coordinator, and then, you know, the season went on, and then obviously they make the move after Nebraska loses. We lose to K-State in 03, um, and I think I believe K-State went on to win the Big 12 championship that year, so it was, it was you know, it was, they were a good football team. Yeah. It was not a problem, because we love Bo. We like to play for Bo. We loved everything he was about. So that was a very easy deal, and it was only one game. We went to play on Michigan State at the Alamo Bowl. Um, so that was, and we thought, even Bo told us, look, I believe I'm gonna be the next head coach at this right. university. I don't know if that's going to be the case for Mickey. Obviously, he's going to have nine games to prove it. Um, but hopefully he can grab them in this show. I mean, he's, he hasn't been here uh, a year yet, yeah. essentially. So hopefully he has the ability to grab their attention, have a voice, have a presence within this team. And just, I, I, I'm, I'll continue to say this, define everyone's role better. There's too much, there's been too much gray area. I think people just don't know where to go. You see with the players. I think they just don't, they, they, there's, they just don't know exactly what to do sometimes. I think to find everyone's role, present it to them as this is, this is what you have to do day in and day out. Right. And it's black and white, it's simple, and you go to work. Trev left the door open for Mickey to win the job. Like, you go out, you win games, you think he has a shot to get the job? Well, I think it's got to be a pretty convincing case. It's got to be a Dabo Sweeney Clemson case. 2007. Um, you yeah. know, Ed, did Ed Orgeron, he, he kept the job at USC. At USC he did. For a but year. that didn't work out. It didn't work out. We've seen it before where West Virginia had that, where they rallied around their coach, he won the, won the bowl, bowl game. game, and then they hired him, and that lasted, I think, a year and a half. So you never know. But, I mean, it's, it, the doors open. What do you think they're looking for? What do you think Trevor's looking for? Well, if the guys respond, but I, Mickey doesn't coach defense, so – how can they improve their defense up front, you know, re-scheme, retool what they do? Um, but, you know, if they got to a bowl game right now in this hole, that, that would be pretty impressive because they, they would have to win six games here out of, out of their final nine. Right. And it's all, it's all power five games. Mm -hmm. There's certainly a Here's some of the candidates I know we, we, a lot of people have thrown around names. Uh, Matt Campbell is the guy who I think that Trev is really interested in. That's the first one on the list at Iowa State. Uh, if you go back and look, he's had five winning seasons at Iowa State. Uh, you go back the last 40 years, they've had like eight winning seasons uh, other than his. So you what he's done there. Luke Fickle at Cincinnati, I don't think he'll leave there. Lance Leipold, he would a, take the a guy I love. I love Lance um, from UNO and UNL, but he's coming at Kansas, and I don't know how many games they can win this year to be able to hire him.
And then Dave Aranda, who would be an amazing hire. LSU defensive coordinator, Wisconsin defensive coordinator, won the Big 12. Worked with Bill Bush, too. And he's worked, and he's been around all these guys, and he knows this level of football. He well. has a, a, a great understanding of Big Ten and how you have to play in the Big Ten, obviously being at Wisconsin. So he would be my 1A, or Dave Aranda would be my, would be my 1A right now. And that would allow you to keep your offensive. How pass. about Mark Stoops? Leaving Kentucky? Remember, he is best friends with Bo Pelini, though. Yeah. So, I mean, do you, like, have that conversation with Bo and go, what do you think, Bo? Uh, Vince Nebraska. Marrow, I can tell you, li likes Nebraska. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Like, so there, there is, I mean, you, know, you got to battle that. We're a basketball school. You got John Calipari throwing shade at football That's there. So, like, there's some stuff there that has my attention. Um, you know, there's a lot. I mean, this thing's going to be deep, though. Like, yeah. Chris Kleiman's name, Jip Leonard's name. I mean, this this will be one of the deepest lists of names. And how many? The, it will be interesting how many guys get raises off this opening. Like, <laughs> well, it's already started. I think the agents are already at work. Yeah, out, today, so. today was like yeah. day one of <laughs> agent day. Like, yeah. all right, just have some guy ask you about Nebraska, and we'll get a nice little bump out of it. No doubt. Interim head coach Mickey Joseph took the podium today for the first time to address the media. Here's what he had to say. This is about Nebraska football. Is bigger than me than anyone else. And I want y'all to understand that. It's bigger than me than anyone else. I want to thank the fans for continuing to support us and, and to ride with us and to stay with us through thick and thin. You, they, they've done that. I want you to know this is a, a great opportunity for me and my family, we understand that. We're here to represent the University of Nebraska to the fullest. And my message to the team was, I know you're hurting. Frost is like a brother to me. He gave me an opportunity to come here and coach at my alma mater, coach at the University of Nebraska. I would always love him and always appreciate him. I would always respect him. The kids would always love him. But I know they were hurting. But at the end of the day, it's gonna, that ball's going to kick off on Saturday. So mentally, we had to get them back and get them ready. We're going to play faster. We're going to tackle in practice. We're going to detail what we're doing with our kids. We're going to make our kids hold themselves accountable and we try to fix the problems. Well, we got nine games left, right? Well, as a coach, you got to stand up here and say, we're trying to win nine games, but we're not worrying about nine games right now. Remember, I just said what? We worry about this game this week. So we got to take this one at a time with these kids. We got to take this one at a time with this staff. So we're going to take one week at a time, and then when we get to nine, then we'll see where we're at. But this week, the most important thing right now is this week is get preparing to get ready for OU. Joining us now to talk more about the changes going on at South Stadium is Steve Sippel from Husker Online. Sip, did you ask your boss if you could be on the show? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, you got a pretty loose PTO policy. <laughs> that's understandable. What's a definitely. PTO? What's what is personal PTO? time off? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I take a lot of it. <laughs> we, both, neither one of these guys were really surprised about what happened on Sunday mm -hmm. based off what happened on Saturday. Were you surprised when the notice came down that Scott Frost had been there? Oh, yeah. Sean took me by surprise when the boss called and said, We got to work today. Um, <laughs> he he I, didn't believe me. He's like, I, I'm like, Quit playing, pulling my leg. I mean, I had been saying it on multiple radio shows that. If it goes bad against North Dakota, they, they could pull the trigger right after that. You did. You said that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess I, I wasn't – I was kind of in the middle of – I wasn't necessarily surprised. Um, and after Trev explained it, it made a lot of sense. Um, I guess I got talked out of it. A lot of people kept saying, oh, he, he's going to wait till the buyout. You know, I got kind of got talked out of it. Um, but as Jay pointed out – you know, seven and a half million dollars is a lot of money, but in the Us. context, yeah, in the context of Nebraska, the the bankroll they have, <laughs> not not a big deal. Mm -hmm. So I guess to answer your question, not overly surprised, but it's not like I I don't want to I don't want to mislead anybody. I didn't predict it, um, I didn't write it that night. Mm -hmm. um, so I was I was you know in that context I wasn't. Sip, this question was posed to me, I think Sunday. Or Monday, <clears throat> someone said, when did you think Scott was not going to be the guy? And I had to think, was there a game? They asked me, was there's a game where you thought this isn't going to work? Mm -hmm. And I had to think back. I, go, I don't know. There's, there's a lot. There's been a lot of losses. Mm -hmm. I thought 2019 at Colorado. Mm. 
low in the 17 nothing lead. Yes. I go, that was where my, I had my doubts. With those fans all day. Yeah. Yeah. Is there, is there a game? Is there a, a certain situation you're like, you start, because we all, we said, we all thought this thing was going to work. Yeah. We thought this, I mean, it was, it was the no-brainer home run hire. Uh, Purdue last year. Yeah. Purdue last year was, a, I thought the writing was sort of on the wall at that point. Um, that's what I'd say. You know, Adrian had a bad game. That was a home game where uh, you'd expect Nebraska to win that game. And they didn't, they didn't play well. That's, that's, when I, that's when I really kind of traced the beginning of the end, really. Mm. Illinois last year, too. The, the, the week zero. Well, sure. Start the season, yeah. I mean, yeah, that was the start of the season. Purdue was didn't look prepared. Yeah. Like, they just came out and, you know, just guys weren't disciplined and, and made mistakes. But yeah, what, what are you expecting the, these three months or two and a half months to be like? I mean, it's, it's a defensive question. It's a question about the defense to me. I mean, the offense looks capable. It look, and it looks sometimes more than capable. That's a pretty good group of skill players. So far against Northwestern, North Dakota, and Georgia Southern, they look capable. <laughs> That's no, true. No offense to the, the offense. Oh, no, no, I got you. I got you. And sp special teams is on the uptick. But the defense is, I, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, it's, it's almost like, it's sort of hard to talk about. It's unra it just unraveled. It's like record bad. Like right. 128th in the country in total defense, 115 rush defense, 113th in pass defense allowed, 116th in third down, and you see scoring defense is 98. And two sacks on the year. Two sacks, and they had four pressures on Saturday. Two of them accounted for the interceptions. So you know what that tells you? Pressures actually help. Mm -hmm. They got two interceptions on the two pressures they got. They out absolutely before. helped. Yeah, and they're not getting any. So I, I thought what Trev did was the appropriate thing and let it play out. I mean, he let it play out till you couldn't let it go anymore. Yeah, my, yeah. Sip, quote, sip, my quote was he didn't want to fire Scott Frost, but he was okay with letting Scott fire himself. Yeah. Losing to Georgia Southern yeah. fires yourself. Kind of worked out that way, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I thought that was appropriate. Yeah. yeah, you think about Eichhorst, he had so much criticism how he fired Bo Peterson, as we know. Like, he didn't want to be that type of agent. Exactly. Or immediately, like, you're on the clock. I mean, it, it really did play itself out. How long was he on the job before the end of the season? Who's that? Trev, last season. July. Like, if he would have fired, so, so basically. No, he was all the whole season. Three, but like three, four months? Yeah, three, four months. So yeah. that would be tough for him to say, I've been here four months, and I know this guy has to go. Exactly. And Trev, and Trev actually said that. I mean, he, he thought he needed to be here for a, an appreciable amount of time to, to be around the program mm -hmm. and to judge it that way. Looking at Trev's press conference on Sunday afternoon, he didn't say a lot, but he still said a lot to yeah. me. You, what, did, you, did you pull anything out of there that's like, ah, uh, I, I know what he's getting at? Mm. Like the grinder comment or the comment about hobbies? Yeah. Professional. Yeah. Professionals. Accountability. <laughs> <Well, laughs> so I, I, I see where you're going with that. A little bit, um, a little bit if, if that was sort of directed at, the, at Scott, maybe a little bit of that. Um, I thought he was respectful to Scott, too, at the same time. And I think that's important. I think if there's other coaches watching, you know, guys who might want this job, um, I'm sure they were impressed by that. I mean, he he was very respectful to a coach who was 16 and 31, mm -hmm. uh, but still a legend here at the University of yeah, Nebraska. Yeah, yeah, and that was a today. that was probably geared not toward coaches, but geared toward the fan base. Smart. I mean, Trev Trev covers all the bases. As far as anything I picked out, I mean, I thought the <laughs> one thing I I think he might have ruled out Urban Meyer. I mean, by saying when he was asked what traits he's looking for in a coach, he started with a person of character. Yeah. Now, I'm not, listen, I, I'm okay with Urban Meyer, yeah. all right? But he, he might have ruled him out with yeah. that because people would go back to that. Let's go to Mickey, and first African-American coach in sports at the University of Nebraska. I think that is a, a interesting thing for kids to be able to look up and see that at Nebraska. Mm -hmm. But as a coach with nine games remaining, what do you think? How do you think he does? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I just go back to the defense. I don't know. He can't. If they can fix the defense. Or if they at least can fix the defense. That's, people, people if he fixes the defense, Jerry Jones will want him. Okay. <laughs> um, do, you, do you remember, you remember um, I think it was 2010 in yeah. the Big 12, Nebraska was struggling those first three games tackling, mm -hmm. and all Bo did was change the safeties. Mm -hmm. And it changed their whole defense. That better, that better. I know it was P.J. Smith came in, but, I mean, there, there are people that maybe could play who aren't, who aren't the favorites of somebody, and maybe a new coach with eyes comes in and says, you need to play those guys. 
just chance. Yeah, I don't know who those players are, Sean. I mean, I, I, on the too deep are there the guys they're playing are the guy are the guys pretty much. I mean, there's like Pola Gates and Singleton. You could you, some of those other safeties. That, uh, is that who you're kind of? Well, yeah, and I mean, I think Omar Brown should. Um, Omar, Omar Brown yeah. should move back to safety. I think that's – or she, excuse me, he should move the corner, okay. and then you should move um, eight back to safety. I think that's what they need to do. It's, yeah, I don't, guys yeah I don't know. I mean, he's not changing – he's not changing staff, so I think what you see is what you're going to get. And I'm not – listen, defenses evolve. Teams evolve. They get better. Um, it, uh, now, how much better can that defense get? That's the question. Well, getting Heinrich back will help. He's going to be back this week. We don't, know, we don't know yet. He should be, but I mean, he's going to have a cast on. So he was wearing a, he was wearing a kind of a, a hard cast, a hard cast on Saturday. And yeah, we've seen guys play with that before. Oh yeah. And what will help is also practicing more physical. Yeah. These teams, they, Nebraska looks like they don't <laughs> they, they practice physical for the first time going into the game. I thought it was everything catches them by surprise. It almost oh, to be yeah. in shock. Oh, Northwestern. I thought when number four came in. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's his Porter? name, Cam Porter? Yeah. I thought the way he ran, how hard he ran, and how physical he ran, shot, it was a shock. It, it seemed like they weren't ready for a running back like that. Mm -hmm. It was like a shock to their system. Well, Damon talks about it all the time. If you don't practice those mm -hmm. things, right. all of a sudden the guy's getting you who hasn't gotten to you during practice, and you have to do something about it, yeah. whether it's a blocker or the guy running the ball. Right. What do you make, Jay, of them switching the off day? Like you were on the last yeah. Nebraska team. You were team. on that one, yeah. You were on the last Nebraska team that had Mondays off. But I loved it. I think it was because you'd play the game, you'd come in on Sundays, maybe 10, 11 o'clock. You film Sundays? Well, you, you, we, we worked out. We'd get a light lift, treatment. we'd run, treatment, and you came in and watched the game film. And then, you know, you're probably out of there by 4 or 5 o'clock, and then you had all day Monday off. You are just a student. Mm -hmm. You could come in, get your treatment, you could watch, I'd usually watch film. I, um, if you wanted to get a night class, some guys had night classes, you'd get them on your Monday so you could get those in. So you had to worry about, because we, back then we were having afternoon practices, so you have to worry about having to leave practice early for night classes, so. You have to go to class? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Wink, wink, yeah, yeah. at times. Class. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I, it's a good, I think, because they would, technically question. it was a voluntary day, but you still had to come in. So you guys never really got, or able to get away from the game. Grant, these guys need more work than, they need a lot of work, obviously, but there's something to say, like, you're just able to get and away. Tuesday becomes way more physical. Yes. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can get after it it's a little bit. the last thing, you have a feel at all for the Oklahoma game? You can give us an early week prediction? Oh, I think it's trouble. I, I mean, it, Oklahoma's offensive numbers aren't great. No. But against UTEP, they did really rev it up. Um, got 45 on UTEP. Ran super fast. Got 21 in the first. Yeah. And then didn't score again to like the third quarter. I mean, it concerns me because these, the these will be the best athletes Nebraska faces. And, and, and Lebby, their offensive coordinator, is, is a big-time coach. Yep. Along the lines of Clay Helton. Who Clay Hel I told Sean all week last week, I'm worried about the Clay helton Chenander matchup. That's the matchup that worried yep. me the most. It really bore itself out. Now, now, now I'm, I'm, I'm similar concern. Yeah, and Dylan, Dylan Gabriel can spin it. Sip, we appreciate it, man. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate that. And thanks for taking the PTO and coming on. All right. <laughs> uh, next up on the show, we take a look at Saturday's game against Georgia Southern in depth and talk with Damon Benning about this week and what lies ahead going forward for Nebraska. As we go to break, images from Saturday's game courtesy of Hale Varsity. Stay with us. We're back soon.
All right, welcome back in. We're going to take a quick look at one play. I know we have other things, bigger fish to fry in this show, but just some of the issues with the defense. Now, if we have some technical difficulties here, so I don't know if this remote's going to work, but I'll be able to break it down here by, uh, by hand. Oh, here we go. We got it. All right. So as we go, this is, and Mark Helfrich uh, talked about this in the game. They did a good job of spreading out, and you get a five-on-five -five situation. We talked about numbers before. So you get five guys in the box against their five off offensive linemen. All of a sudden now, it's just the safety and the running back. You better be able to come in and fill. Now, they do a good job here as well as we go, as the play runs. They get Ernest Hausman able to wait because he's got coverage. Looks like it's an RPO situation, so he has to respect a little bit just to get another guy out of the box. But all of a sudden, you get a hat on hat here. And this was, a, I think it was a second along, maybe even a third along situation. They want to draw. You get guys in pass rush situations up the field. You get center on Rymers. All of a sudden, it's Buford and this guy. And I don't know if there's any safety. I, you find me one. I don't, Ronnie Lott, I don't think he can make this play with this much space to deal with. But... I like the effort by, by Caleb Tanner here, retracing of steps, but I just think he could have laid out and made the tackle right here, like something. He kind of veers off for some reason. I just He's there, somehow trip him up to maybe slow, get Buford to, to hopefully get him. But again, I will give credit to Georgia State. They, they spread Nebraska out. They called the right plays at the right time, and, and Nebraska obviously just did not have no answer for him uh, all game, obviously giving up 642. All right, let's check out the highlights. It was an amazing between third and fourth quarter like show with laser stuff on the field. It was really incredible. Game started with Kyle Vantries being on fire. This is three weeks in a row where the quarterback's really, really good early. Six of eight early uh, by Kyle Vantries. That was a nice throw to Burgess. And then another one to Burgess again, getting them to the point where they had a chance to get the running game going. And they abused the middle of Nebraska's defense all day long. Jail White went 17 for 83 with that touchdown. Uh, Thompson had a great day, too. Uh, you have to admire the way he stood in there. He took some shots, made some throws, and actually used his legs a lot in this game, something that we really hadn't seen much of him when he was at Texas. Anthony Grant, another nice game, rushed for 12 yards. One of a ton of explosives they had on the running game. And then here we talked about using your legs. How about this? You didn't expect this from Casey Thompson, did you? No, he's, very, he has, he's sneaky shifty. Yeah. <laughs> Sneaky shifty. It's hard to get shifty. I don't know if that's I got the that. right way to, to put it. You, can, you guys can uh, use that if you want. Like his dad a little bit. Yeah. Sneaky mm -hmm. shifty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His dad was actually a really good athlete. Uh, more with Kyle Van Trees. We talked about how on fire he was early in the game, and they really weren't stopping him, and they weren't getting pressure, as Sean said a couple times. Two sacks on a season, and, of course, no sacks in this, and you'd mentioned that. Van Trees doesn't get sacked a lot. There's another one of those times where they just shifted the running back to the other side and ran to the weak side, and you see the touchdown there. Um, that was a 26-yard touchdown run. More Kyle Vantries. Here's the one time they got pressure. They got pressure twice. That was one interception. Nice interception by Marcus Buford. Very nice. High nice point. Nice ball. Very good. That's what you want. And the craziest thing, he's the guy that got two interceptions. Nebraska is plus two in the turnover category and still lose. Yeah, it doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> doesn't happen a lot. It's going back all the way to the start of Bo. Uh, it didn't happen a lot. There's Casey Thompson. Deep pass to Oliver Martin. And brings you again to Anthony Grant getting a touchdown there. 27 for 138 yards in that touchdown for Anthony Grant. And then Green. What? That's another. We talk about this play a lot, but you're talking about simply misassignment, right? This, well, this is one that Mark Helfers did a good job breaking down in this game, too. Nebraska, right here. Two guys in the gap. Yeah. You can see him right there. Yeah, essentially, two guys in the B gap. It hits A. You just got to. It has to be such. It's. It's such a fine moment there. It's such, you, you have to be. Everyone has to be on the same page, and Nebraska wasn't. Two touchdowns there in the game for Green. Uh, 180 yards that he went with. Um, and then you also had Green for that touchdown. He had one of those games where he didn't even play a lot in the second half and still had big numbers. They brought the backup in and had the, the big runs in the second half while he was out. Uh, that made it 28 to 21. Nebraska still trailing in the game. Casey Thompson comes back. Deep left. This is a really good throw here. A little late, but it gave Trey Palmer again a chance. 24 yards. Uh, Casey Thompson Pass deep middle to Marcus Washington, who had the big play early in the game, 29 yards there. And then again, Casey Thompson, nice ball handling. Very nice. Very nice ball handling, two-yard rush. Well, we see these plays like that this week, though, or is that a Coach Frost wrinkle that Whipple wasn't? I mean, that, that will be interesting to see if we see the option this week. It's a good question to see that. It works. you got to use it. We all know that it works. Um, Kyle Van Trees, another throw. Here's another touchdown pass. Um, that made it 35-28. to 28. Georgia Southern still up on Nebraska. We keep seeing A.J. Allen just gets better every week. And I said this before, he reminds me a little bit 
of a young LP. It just some of the stuff he does, it reminds me. Look at this movie makes in the hole here, getting in for the touchdown. 35-35, Nebraska all tied up with Georgia Southern. But Kyle Van Trees, we talked about it earlier, how hot he was early. He was hot late as well. But this is another pressure. Pressure here, another interception. Marcus Buford making the play. Almost a one-handed interception there. Uh, no return on it, but it was a good play getting to pressure on him. Casey Thompson comes back, pass deep to Marcus Washington, down to the one. This was reviewed. First they said it was kind of an incomplete pass. Mm -hmm. Then somebody thought it was a touchdown, and then they put it at the one. This was a, this was the second review of, of this series because this is where um, Smothers had the fumble too. They yep. review as well. That actually hurt Nebraska because they scored so quickly that yep. you know True. they could have maybe ran off another minute or two o'clock. Would have been nice. They were scoring on average in a minute forty seconds, so you had to run off a lot to get that done. Another perfect throw by Kyle Van Trees uh, down the field, and then the quarterback draw, which was kind of open. All game, I thought, and they didn't need to go to it. They'd be able to their running backs and get it there to take the lead. Uh, but Nebraska had a chance for a field goal, and I thought this was good from where I was sitting. Yeah, but but, yeah, it yeah. If, if you're sitting in the in the west side there, but it was close. Yep, there was but, plenty of leg. No Final Brennan Frankie on the long kick. He's usually their long guy. That was surprising. That was surprising that he didn't come in. Uh, and the ball got there. It was just you know off to the left. Nebraska stats. We talked about it a lot. 642 yards for Georgia Southern. 37 of 56 passing for 409 yards and again a team against Nebraska wins the time of possession but Nebraska does win the turnover battle and lose the game. Here are your players of the game against Georgia Southern. Casey Thompson not a surprise as well as he played 300 yards passing three rushing touchdowns uh, another good game for Casey Thompson showing that it was a good choice bringing him in and then Marcus Buford we mentioned it really the defense struggled all day long but he got the two interceptions to help Nebraska's defense out and get the ball back. All right, time to welcome in our friend, former Husker I back, Damon Benning. DB, how are you doing? What's your reaction to the move that happened on Sunday? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I, I, I think I wasn't as surprised as I think maybe I would have thought had you told me it would happen before the buyout a couple of months ago, right? So uh, I just think the way things were going, and, and I understand what the numbers were uh, after October 1st, but I just asked myself two questions, right? Especially knowing Trev as well as I do. You know, what about the student athletes in terms of providing them the opportunity to have some success and and how much would it have cost him to not make the move? And and I just think if we're not willing to ask ourselves that question, then it's truly not about the university. And I think that's what it has to be when you make decisions like this. It's it's not about any one man, it's for the greater good of those student athletes and and, and that fan base as a whole. So I, I wholeheartedly understood the decision. DB, uh, you know Mickey Joseph as well as anybody. Um, we've known him for years. What do you think he's going to bring in this role for Nebraska as the interim head coach? I think first and foremost, he's going to bring clarity of the message, right? And, and, and I don't want to undersell that. Anytime you're seeking leadership and guidance, you like clarity of message. And and with Mickey, or excuse me, Coach Joseph, I think you're going to get that. He's very direct. Um, he's authentic. So what he says, I think people have a good idea and understanding of what he means. And the second thing is I think he's going to provide accountability. He's never been the favorite. He's kind of always been the underdog. He's done things the hard way his whole life, even as talented as he was coming out of Marrero. You know, he was a small guy that other other schools didn't give a chance to. So he's a fighter and, and a competitor by nature. So he's going to bring that to the table right away because he, he's never had any clear cut advantages, at least as as I've known him through his adult life. And I, and I think he'll, he'll provide that kind of that gauge and that measure to the football team immediately. Yeah, LSU wanted to make him a defensive back coming out of high school. Um, that's that. Yeah. Let's, talk, let's talk about what could happen with the defense. Is there a way, Damon, you think that they could fix it or tweak it to make it look a little bit better than it did on Saturday? Yeah, you got a couple of choices. I've thought a lot about this, kind of how we play coverage and, and, and how I've learned coverage, um, having been a coordinator before. And, and I think you got to do it one of two ways. If you're going to have a soft box, uh, play with six or less in the box, and I think you've got to have a little bit tighter coverage where you can have quicker run support and and really try to be disruptive and be kind of muggers 
at the line of scrimmage in the secondary to re reroute or disrupt timing. The other thing is, if you, you can add another body to the box, but you have to loosen the coverage a little bit. So far, and I think Jay would agree with this, we've seen some, we've seen a lot of too deep shell and being light in the box. Mm -hmm. And when you don't fit in the run game quickly or correctly, playing quarter, quarter, half or cover six like they like to do is a recipe for disaster because you have safeties that are fitting in the run game from 12 to 14 yards off the ball in a gaps, right? That's those the gap to the left and to the right of the center. It's just too difficult a fit to be that light in the box. So if you're going to play with five, you're going to have to play a little bit tighter coverage. If you're going to use seven or six in the box, then you can afford to, to play the palms or the shell that he likes to play sometimes by reading the number two. That would be palms coverage. So you can't have it both ways. I think you'll see them tighten up. You see, you saw those corners try to play a little bit more press yeah, as the game went along, but they just didn't win enough 50-50 balls. Man, Trees was unbelievable. I mean, sometimes you tip your cap to the pitch and catch, and those some of those balls, I I was like, are you serious? Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, I don't, I didn't always love the effort or the technique, but some of those balls where only his guy could go get it and Nebraska didn't win any 50, 50 balls. It was, it's a recipe for disaster from day one. Damon, what do you think of the running backs right now? Uh, the way Anthony Grant, AJ Allen, uh, the way they've played here for these first three games. Yeah, they've been impressive. You know, I, I, I'm, I think this week will be interesting against Oklahoma, you know, because Venables coach Venables is kind of the anti Alex Grinch, you know, Alex Grinch went light, quick, um, and very disruptive gapping guys out coach Venables will get back to the bigger stronger front trying to play with D lineman and play behind that so I'll be curious to see how that translates but what I do like there's three positives number one they're very decisive they're downhill guys so as a defender when I feel like guys are always trying to step on my toes it's annoying right I don't get to do the dictating like I like to do number two they're very good in small spaces, so they don't need a lot of room to make a guy miss. And number three, the first guy never gets them. So you can be a little disjointed up front and they give you an opportunity to have success because they don't have a lot of negative plays. And I think Nebraska is going to have to utilize that, especially, you know, we don't really know the status of Teddy Prohaska. If he doesn't go this week, you know, Nebraska is going to have to do some shuffling uh, heading into the bye week. So I, I like the fact that those guys are decisive and they really have a definitive running style. Damon, in about 30 seconds, do they have to have Casey Thompson running some or at least presenting the challenge of the run in order to be successful against Oklahoma? Absolutely. Uh, you, you, you got two options. If they do both, they'll be in good hands with able to run the football. Get a second back in the backfield in addition to the quarterback, which will really provide some complex forms to the running game. Or number two, run with Casey Thompson out of the one back look and at least keep defenders honest. Two of Oklahoma's top three tacklers, tacklers are in the secondary, uh, and you have to keep those guys honest in terms of fitting in the run game. Damien, we appreciate the time, man. We'll see you next week. All right, you guys have a great rest of the show. All right, it's time for another break. Next up, Sean dives into how the change at leadership will affect recruiting. But first, another look at last Saturday night's game with images from Hale Varsity.
Make sure you visit the wrap up website and cast your vote today because it's a really easy question. It's basically yes, no, or something else. Welcome back to Big Red Wrap Up. I'm Michael Severe, Sean Callahan. Thanks for joining us. Time to talk some recruiting. How does this affect recruiting? We've seen it before. Well, I think right now there's two things going on. Um, the current staff is going to continue to work, fight, because they're, they're going to operate in, like they have a chance to keep their job. So you're going to see this group of coaches still go out on the road, still do recruiting probably on the bye weeks, still maybe go to local high school football games. Um, you know, there's 14 commits for Nebraska right now in this class. So uh, they're going to do their best to kind of correspond and, and, and talk to these different recruits and, and keep a dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will not be easy. We've been through a lot of these coaching changes at Nebraska. We know that. Um, if a new coach comes in, he's going to want to do some of his own things. So mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a holding pattern at this point. And, and there's a lot of key dates we're going to go through that you got to look at yeah. uh, on this calendar. Before we get that real quick, what the guy they brought in to be the wide receiver coach in Mickey Stead, what do you know about him? Mike Cassano, you know, Mike Cassano was the receivers coach a year ago as well when they fired um, Matt Lubick. Yes. So, uh, he, he's, he worked with Mark Whipple. They got a connection uh, that goes back. Uh, but let's go back to those dates. Uh, so crew recruiting dates, yeah. Yeah, you know, talking about these recruiting dates for Nebraska, these are the dates you really want to look at. Um, the transfer portal, now te there's players that are going in, which I've talked to a lot of people, they don't really understand how guys are going in because there's going to be a new rule. There's going to be a 45-day period where the portal opens for business in December, um, and it's the day after the college football playoff teams are announced. Um, so that will be Monday, December 5th. And, you know, when you get a new coach, that's going to be a really important day uh, to kind of get your ducks in order because then you have 45 days. December 21 is the early signing day for high school and junior college players. That is the latest it can be on a calendar. It's the third Wednesday, um, and this year, December 1st, falls on a Thursday. Right. So um, it's a really late signing day, which that helps. You know, you, you've got more time in December now to go out and do things. Mm -hmm. um, January 19th, the portal closes after 45 days. January 23rd, is the first day of UNL second semester classes. So there is a good window in there uh, for Nebraska, um, you know, depending on who the head coach is, mm -hmm. to roster manage. And there's no more 25-man rule. There's no more scholarship things they have to mess with. So this will be easier um, in some ways, but also hard because you don't know how many guys can leave this team or recruiting class. Our in-state recruit is Caleb Benning. We, we both know him well. I was at the game on Friday night when he got injured, was playing really well. It's got some really big offers. Yeah, just picked up a Wisconsin offer, um, and I believe he's now 195. His his weight has gone up. I talked to Damon last week. Mm -hmm. Saw a picture of him standing next to Damon. He towers. He Damon. towers now over Damon now. Yeah, um, but <laughs> Caleb Benning, uh, one of the top 2024s in the state of Nebraska right now, with the Husker offer, with an Iowa offer, just picked up a Wisconsin offer. Mm -hmm. um, so he will be a key regional target, no doubt. That's going to have his pick of the Big Ten West, and and maybe some other national programs that you know, come into the area. But I'm sure a lot of people are going to gauge him out. You know, he's a son of a former Husker. Um, you want to make sure, is he really interested in leaving Nebraska? Is right. he really interested maybe in leaving the Big Ten? Uh, there's obviously some, Iowa's done a great job recruiting Caleb Benning. Wisconsin's now very interested in the picture. Uh, but an extremely talented player. Um, has been on the varsity basketball team there as well as a freshman. Yeah, he's really a heady player. And question is what position he plays. I think it's in the secondary. Is it safety? Is it corner? Um, nickel or whatever. Or yeah. nickel, yeah, no doubt about that. But lot, lots of ability. And, and, you know, a guy like this, typically you have your decision made yeah. maybe April, May, June of sure. next year. So a lot of time mm -hmm. um, for a guy like Caleb Benning. No doubt. Thanks, Sean. Be sure to vote on this week's sideline survey. As I mentioned, it's really easy for you. Do you agree with the dismissal of Scott Frost? Yes, no, or should have waited until after October 1st? 72%, the majority rules say yes, it was the right decision. 16% <coughs> still say no, and another 12% say he should have waited until after the date where the buyout went down. Time to take a look around the Big Ten. Minnesota throttled Western Illinois 62 to 10. Washington State, although got dominated on the box score, beat number 19 Wisconsin 17 to 14. And Iowa lost to in-state rival Iowa State for the first time in six years, 10 to 7. We have a winner in our game day photo contest. BJ on Twitter sent this image of a father and a son duo taking in the game on Saturday. We hope the game day atmosphere and the experience was a good one, even though the game turned sour. Remember to send in your best game day photo each week for a chance to win great prizes. So, Iowa finally, Iowa State finally gets that win over Iowa. It's the first time since 2014 that they beat them. 
Nebraska hasn't beat Iowa since 2014 either. Maybe Look it's a chance. You. Look at <laughs> Maybe you there's a chance. Matt Campbell. Maybe there's a chance. <laughs> Matt Campbell, I'm just saying. Iowa's <laughs> averaging seven points a game and 152 yards of total offense. Iowa's play. offensive line is not good. They have, they, they're str they only, well, they're playing four sophomores, I believe. Two scholarship just, receivers yeah. dressing yeah. out right now. My, yeah, my favorite bad. stat by them is in the second half, they had a, a zero success rate. <laughs> zero. That's the analytics to determine what you do on first, second, and third down. It was zero. That's, it's impossible. Like they have to block to a punt or a kick to win games. That's right? the way they or have to do it. Or get four yeah. turnovers a game like they did last year. No doubt about you know, that. <laughs> they were on that wicked streak. You they're better just, have a good kicker. Yeah. <laughs> Chris wants to know, and I guess it is kind of an obvious answer, I think, but Chris on Facebook wants to know why the defense is opposite of last year. It's everything they lost, right? Well, they lose six starters. And, and six three of those guys players. were grown men. Yeah. 24-year-old starters. Three, three yeah. guys in the secondary, three guys up front. I mean, um, you know, you get the Dismuke, Deontay Williams, Cam Taylor Britt. I mean, Cam Taylor Britt's second round draft pick. Yep. He's playing on Sundays. Yeah. Stilly, uh, Doman. Uh, Doman, and then Daniels. Yeah, and Daniels, I think that's the one. Even though he didn't get that drafted and he was injured, yep. he took up two guys. Remember he dominated mm -hmm. the center for Iowa two yep. years ago. Yep. This is a guy who really took up and dominated the middle of that line, and you don't have anybody like that right now. I think it's hard. I tell them people, I think you always – when you go three and nine, you don't ever think you have that great of players and it's all t until they're gone. And they're like, mm -hmm. oh, boy. That's uh, – we miss those guys. It's, it's very apparent. I mean, Nebraska's – I mean, that, that performance on Sunday, I've been a part of some bad defensive performances yeah. at Nebraska. Yeah. And, and I've seen some other bad uh, defensive performances at Nebraska. That was the worst one I have, I have witnessed. Because Considering the context of the opponent. Correct. Right. I mean, this team was playing – eight years ago, they were playing one double-A football. Yeah. It was kind of like Ball State, though, yeah. 07. Oh, yeah. But yep. Ball State had a quarterback who was a third-round pick. Nate Davis. Mm -hmm. And the wide receiver would have been a big-time pick, but he got and Brady hurt. Hoke would be comparable yeah. to yeah. a Clay Helton. Exactly, right. It, was, it reminded me of that game in some ways. Yeah, Ball State had some really good players on there, and they ended up going, I think, 11-1 and one that year, if I remember correctly. Um, John from Facebook, Sean, wants to know, why not change out the defensive coordinator? You fire the head coach, defensive coordinator – Defense is the problem. I mean, what would you do at that point? Would you just make Mike Dawson the defensive coordinator? Is that going to really fix the issues? I mean, in, in a lot of ways, you know, Dawson and Shenander are almost like co-coordinators. They have a very tight relationship. I just don't know if there's a, an answer right. that would fix this, you, that would be fair yeah. to the players. Yeah, well, you fix the defensive issues by practicing better, harder, more efficient have a clear defined role what they want all your guys to do and tweak some stuff tweak some stuff with coverages like we already talked about but they I, I just don't think Nebraska Are they has been practice pre snap read I mean I, definitely yes. those running plays. but they I'll tell you what like the other play I wanted to break down um, we just didn't have enough time to get to it was the first touchdown Garrett Nelson is just was on the edge and he gets zone away and he gets caught again looking at the ghost motion mm -hmm. like that is that's was so perplexing to me because he's been such a I mean, he, I know he said he's struggled at times, but he's played a lot of good snaps. And you, you have to. You can see up here. Like, he takes a step. Like, that's his play. He should be making a tackle right there at the line of scrimmage for, for a no gain. Because the linebacker's gets, got that ghost he motion. He steps so that go. Yeah, that's not his play. Like, wh why? Why is that? And I don't know if, it's a, if they're trying too hard, but to me, that's a day one installation Tackle down, hand on hip, and I talked about it last week. It's you're in that position. It's cut back, bootleg, reverse. reverse. That's right. not his guy. You play inside out. So it's just little things like that. It just makes. If if that was a true freshman, I might give him a pass. But it's not. It's Garrett Nelson. He's been playing. Uh, he's been playing a lot of live bullet reps. So that's it's things like that. It just doesn't make sense. Real question, Sean. Do you think that the Nebraska job is a good job? I think it is, especially in the context of what college football is right now. Number one, Nebraska had 88,000 fans still in that stadium. There aren't a lot of places that are drawn like that still in, in today's world that we live in. Uh, number two, the money. I, I think the Big Ten Conference right now, where you're at going forward, the new facilities being built. Yep. No one's going to have a facility probably like that going forward with NIL and other things. So I think there's a lot of things that make it. The hardest challenge remains recruiting. You have the fewest amount of four and five stars within 500 miles of you than any Power 5 school in America, but you're expected to win at a level like a Kansas basketball or something. You know, it's, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, you look at UCLA's game. They had 20,000 people in the Rose Bowl yeah, this weekend. Yeah, which is embarrassing. Burning question, Sean. My burning question is, how will this team play for Mickey Joseph in, in what has obviously been a week like none of us has ever seen before? Can the, if they turn up the intensity in practice, is that going to show in the defensive end? Or is it more of a schematic, uh, just, having, just not having enough guys who can play, you know, have, have played enough football in this defense yet? My question is, can the guys have fun on Saturday? Um, you're coming off a tough week. You're going to have to have fun. You're going to have to play like that against Oklahoma. 
I think they will, but that's my question. Don't forget to head to our website and Facebook page to click on the prediction. Jay, Sean, and I will tell you exactly what to expect on Saturday. Mickey Joseph's Huskers welcome Oklahoma to Memorial Stadium for the first time since 2009. The rivalry matchup is set, scheduled for 11 a.m. kickoff on Big Fox. We'll be back next week to break down the game and take stock of the first third of the season. Our guest will be former Husker linebacker Jay Foreman. Our thanks to Stephen Sippel, Damon Binning, and of course our student volunteers in the call center tonight. Joining us for Jay Moore and Sean Callahan, I'm Michael Severe. We'll see you next week on Big Red Wrap-Up.